grace, his mercy, and his peace be with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Today, we're continuing our sermon series looking at some different topics related to John the Baptist and questions related to him. And today, I'd like to look with you at the timing of all things. Relating to John's life, did God actually time and pre-plan and predetermine John? His birth, his ministry, the events of his days, and even his death. And relating to us, does God also predetermine, pre-plan, and select and elect our time and appoint the events of our lives and the courses in which we take? How about the events of our country, the events of the nations of the world, and even drive all history according to his purposes in Jesus Christ? take a look at that today because the answer to these questions or to this question is really going to make a super big difference because if you think that it's all up to you to choose, elect, determine the timing of everything and the events and make it all work, not only your life but your death or also the events of our country and of all of the world and history and it's all up to you, that's pretty scary. Because, frankly, we can't control such things. It's too powerful, too big for us. But if God has the power and has determined ahead of time in his word what he's going to accomplish and bring his purposes to pass for your life, your events of your life, even your death, and also the events of the world and the courses of countries and nations and driving all history towards final purposes in Jesus Christ, well then, frankly, we Christians have a calm confidence and a wondrous courage as we go into the days ahead, knowing that there's a God above us who is appointing the timing selected for each and everything until the end of time. Let's take a look at that today and see what we can learn about that according to God's Word. Now, first of all, if you think of the world and those who are of the world, non-Christians, they would look at this and say, it is all up to us. Because after all, there's no God. So it must be in our hands to determine the course and events of our days, even determine the time of our death, and to run the course of history by determining our country's destiny. And we will drive it towards its purposes. It's all up to us. Pretty scary, that's their view. Now, they, in the world, some people believe in a God, not the Christian God, but they believe that there is a, a God who, like the deists would believe, that God is a great clockmaker, a, a watchmaker, and he set up the world like a huge clock. It's wondrously designed, but then he takes a hands-off approach, backs away from it, and lets history just run its course. Everything is run by random chance and events, according to certain natural principles that God set up in the beginning, but he's not driving it. He created the clock and he just lets it run, and now it's again up to you to determine the course of your life and the destiny of countries and all the world, even all history. So that's the world, but what do we learn from John the Baptist? Let's take a look at him today in the scriptures, and we'll start with this in John chapter 1, verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed. He did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. They said to him, Then who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Of course, you have, you've got to trill your voice there a little bit, right? When you, when you speak like John the Baptist. But what is he saying when he says that? He says, I am fulfilling a word of Scripture. Which word is he fulfilling? What was it again? Isaiah, Isaiah. Isaiah right? Very good, Kareem. And that's Isaiah 40. He's fulfilling, he says, this is what I'm here for, I'm fulfilling Isaiah 40, verse 3, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, 
make straight in the desert a highway for our God, etc. And so he's fulfilling something written in Isaiah. Now, when did Isaiah write his works? Around about approximately Seven. eight centuries, yeah, 700 to almost 800 years before John King. And John is testifying, I am the fulfillment of that scripture written eight centuries ago. What does that teach you and me about the timing of all things? Was John's life predetermined? Yes. Yes. Amen? Was it pre-planned? Yes. In fact, very clearly spoken of in scripture eight centuries or seven or eight centuries ahead of time. God determined his birth. In fact, when was he born according to Christ? About six months ahead of time. Christ, six months later. That was to predetermine. His lineage, because his parents were from the house of Aaron, the priestly class. His family and his relatives, because who was his cousin? Jesus, Jesus Christ, as kinsman. Uh, what was his location? Was that predetermined, would you say? Vivian, what you say? Mm -hmm. Should he have been born in Timbuktu? He was born in Judea and in the wilderness until the time of his manifestation to Israel. He was located precisely according to the appointments of God. Also, his ministry was that uh, predetermined? Mm -hmm. I'm fulfilling something that was spoken of eight centuries ahead of time. What I would say, I'm here to prepare the way of the Christ who is at the very gates. He's here. His words, his actions, even the events of his days were pre-planned. How about his death? You know, the scripture doesn't say exactly that his death was pre-planned and predetermined. However, we do know when he saw Christ, he said, he's here. My joy is now full. He must increase and I must decrease. So what was John? He's the warm-up performer at the great concert of God. Jesus is the chief number one act. You can't have the worship, I mean the, uh, the, the, the concert warm-up artist still on stage when the chief artist and performer and singer comes on. He's got to step off. His job is to warm up the crowd, to prepare them for the one who's to come. John had to depart before Christ fully ascended into all the glory of his ministry and even his cross. And so, was his death even predetermined? The timing of it. Before he was born? Yes. It's predetermined. His lineage, his, uh, his birth, his, his family, his ministry, his death, all appointed by God Almighty. Now, did he make choices in his life? Did he actually choose his course too? Yeah, he makes his choices. He did his best, just like you and I do. But his life was appointed by God, predetermined. Who pre predetermined the timing of his days, when he'd be born and what would happen in those days according to time, and the fulfilling of the purpose of it to accomplish what God had foretold. So that's John. All precise. Say the word precise. 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 Precisely timed by God. But that's John, you might say. What about us? Well, you and me. Are our lives also as timed out and appointed and predetermined by God as was his? Or do we just live by chance? Are we just up for random uh, chance in the world? Or is our life appointed too? Well, we might say... Our life is kind of random chance. Because you know what? John was famous. I'm not like John. He's the famous one. I'm just an average person. You know, he had great purposes to prepare the world for the coming of Christ. But we're just average, ordinary people. Uh, not as great. You know, he was special. We're ordinary. But let's take a look at whether God is actually not just timing John's life, but appointing and driving your life, and even our country, the nations of the world, even all of history, according to his great purposes, driving it for its final conclusion, according to his design 
in Jesus Christ. And if he is, then we can have a real calm confidence and a great wondrous courage as we face the future. If not, well, it's all up for grabs, a random free-for-all pandemonium, well then, it's pretty scary. Let's take a look at God's relationship to time. What do we know about that? Well, first of all, I got a watch here. Who set up time in the first place? John, who set it up? God set up time. Let's read that in the Bible. At the very beginning, we read that when God created the heavens and the earth on the first day, let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light good, God separated the light from the darkness, and there was evening and there was morning one day. So that was the first day. He set up time. He set up a way for us to measure time. When, which day was that? Well, yeah, but also day four, when he, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth and to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So if you look out at the stars at night, you can imagine it. God set it up like a huge clock. It's constantly going. Ch -ch 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 -ch. <laughs> stars are moving. Everything's moving up there. By it, we measure a day. We measure the season. We measure the year by the course of the sun and such things. So God is obviously the author of time. But did he just make a watch, step back, and let it run on its own? Or does he take a hands-on approach? What do you say, Karen? Hands-on? Let's see how hands-on he was. A few years later, when the world turned wicked and evil, and we get to Noah's days, God says in Genesis 6, My spirit shall not abide in man forever for his flesh, but his days shall be 120 years. And then in those 120 years, God sends the flood and washes the world away. Was that appointed ahead of time? Jeff, yes or no? Yes. 120, and it came to pass at the precise time. Then, God, uh, in the 600 years uh, of Noah, in the 600th year, when the flood of waters came upon the earth, God made it rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Can you all say with me the word 40? 40. 40. Great biblical number, mm -hmm. an appointed time for the rain to begin and the rain to end. How about for the receding of the flood, Genesis 8? In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters dried off from the earth. Isn't that kind of a coinky dink? <laughs> it just so happened the waters recede on the next year, in the first month, on the first day of that month, we got a new world. God is appointing driving the history of the ancient world, we can see for sure. How about uh, the time for Abraham? God called Abraham at a proper time and said, a Savior will come forth from you. And he timed the time for Abraham's descendants to be in Egypt, even before, way before they went down. He told Abraham, let's read it in Genesis 15, verse 13 and following. The Lord said to Abraham, Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be slaves there, and they will be oppressed for 400 years. How long, Ken? Four zero zero. Sounds like a 40 again, by the way. <laughs> and they shall come back here in the fourth generation from the iniquity, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Not only is he watching over the history of Israel, but the history of the land of Canaan, the Amorites, I'm going to let them fill up the measure of their sins that when Joshua comes back four centuries later, he can wipe them out in great concrete because they're sinners. So God is orchestrating, commanding, hands-on, driving history. How about their coming out of Egypt? God visited them at the 400 years. And then he brought them out, and they went to Mount Sinai. Moses ascended the mounts, where he received the Ten Commandments. And how long was he up there, Nancy? Yeah. Forty. Yeah. He was in the cloud, upon the mountain, 40 days and 40 nights. Would you say 40 with me again? Forty. <laughs> Is our God timing these events? Tick, tick, tick. Right in precise measure. 
the course of history. Then they came and spied out the land for how many days? Oh. Of Canaan, 40 days. And then they rebelled, wanted to go back to Egypt. How long did they have to wander in the wilderness on account of those 40 days? 40 years. 40 years. One year for each day. Say it again. 40. 40. Oh, you guys are with me. <laughs> David in his life. What about, what about individual lives, though? Does he drive those things too? Well, consider David. David, his life was about battles, about war, about failures and about triumphs. It seemed like craziness going on. And yet we read here in 1 Kings 2. David reigned over Israel 40, 40 years. years. Seven years over Judah and 33 years over Israel. Seven plus three is 40. Do you see a small pattern developing here? Is God precise? Is he driving David's individual life? How about the kingdoms? Remember, after David, the kingdoms were divided, north and south, Israel, Judah. And in those days, I mean, we have craziness, absolute pandemonium, a free-for-all seemingly going on. You have sometimes people ascending the throne in peace, other times assassinations. There's wars, there's obedience, there's disobedience, there's judgments, there's rewards, there's mercy, there's, there's wrath. There's all kinds of crazy things going on. But at the end of it, after all of that, you read that of the kings, Israel had 40, 20 kings, Judah had 20 kings, 20 plus 20 equals Jerry? 40. 40. Say it again. 40. 40. Is God, I ask you, driving history? Even with all of the machinations, uh, the, the, the courses being set by people, their strivings, their schemings, their, their choices, God is overarchingly a very hands-on approach. We can see. They went into exile, into Babylon. And what does Daniel do? He's like, how long are we going to be here? Let's check out and see what Jeremiah said. Oh, 70 years. Does that sound like a biblical name? Number? 70, once again. And when Daniel was there, the king, as well as Daniel, had visions of kingdoms to come. First there would come Babylon, and then would come the Medo-Persians, and then would come the kingdom of the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And in the days of the fourth kingdom, God would set up his kingdom through his Christ, would appear the fourth generation from Daniel. Now this is before the Greeks were anybody before the Romans were anybody, before the Medes and the Persians were anybody, God said, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, that's going to happen, and this, all in their appointed time. Is God appointing and driving history? Can you have confidence and courage that your God is in charge? Absolutely. Then came the time for John the Baptist. We read about that one already. And then came the time for Christ. Let's read what, Jay, uh, what Paul says about that. Galatians 4, let's read it. But when the time had fully come, say fully come. Fully come. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Did Jesus come at just any random time of history? He came at the precise time, full fullness of time. What's that mean? Well, the fullness of scripture. You could also say the world was a perfect setup for salvation. The Romans, the Pax Romana, there was peace across the world. There were perfect roads for traveling and dispersing the gospel quickly and freely to the whole world. And there was one language at that time. Everybody spoke Greek. So there was no hindrance in terms of languages. Languages. I couldn't even say the word languages. They had no such problem. <laughs> and Christ was born six months after John, timed, a star appeared at the appointed time in the east for the wise men to mark his birth. His start of ministry, Mary tried to jump the gun, said, uh, make, them, make some wine for them. Oh woman, what have you to do with me? My hour, my time has not yet come. Jesus was very clear in understanding he had a time. He did the miracle, but shortly thereafter he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. His ministry was timed. And they couldn't arrest him, remember? Why? 
because Jesus was just a sly fox and he could escape them? No, they could not arrest him because his hour, his time had not yet come. Therefore, they couldn't touch him yet. <laughs> then their hour did come, and they came with, lantern, uh, with torches and weapons and lanterns to arrest him, and he said, this is your hour, this is your time, appointed, and the hour, the power of darkness. He had an appointed time to die. When was that? Just a random day? It was on the exact, precise, orchestrated, pre-planned event of Passover. Exactly when the Jews were celebrating the shedding of the blood of a lamb who saved them in the land of Egypt. And here ascends the Christ as the greater lamb to shed his blood for you. Do you see how God is driving this? With all of man making his decisions, orchestrating the events of history, driving it to its purposes in Jesus Christ. While we were still weak and helpless, says Paul, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then he was buried, remember, precisely on time. They had to bury him before sunset. Three days and three nights he was in the belly of the earth as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. He had a precise timing for his resurrection on the third day. Then a time to appear to the disciples for how many days did they get? Can you guess? Even if you don't know, guess. What's the number? 40 days. Say it again. 40 days. And then he ascended and went up to heaven. And on the 50th day, another big number in scripture, was the sending of the Holy Spirit for the preaching of liberation and freedom to the world through the preaching of the gospel. 50, by the way, is the day of the year of Jubilee, the day when everybody gets set free in Israel, appointed, predetermined, Precise. God is ticking off history exactly on time. And 50, by the way, is seven sevens and a day to preach salvation. The apostles had their time. Individuals, again, Paul says, I was set apart before I was born. In the same way as John the Baptist. He had his ministry time, called and ministered. And he says, toward the end, he says, the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. Are our days timed as his? A time to be born, Ecclesiastes 3, and a time to depart this world. If you don't believe that, then you're going to be just going gluten-free and doing whatever you can to extend your days. And we should do such things. But is your death in your hands in charge or God's? And isn't it comfortable and encouraging to know it's in his? There's a time for the preaching of the gospel. Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times, the time of the Gentiles, are fulfilled. A time for grace, which is now, the salvation to the ends of the earth. A time for the end, and what will happen towards the end? You know this one very well, Art. You've quoted this one, 2 Timothy 3, but understand this. That in the last times, there will come times of stress. A great decline in morals. An increase in evil. Most men's love will grow cold. Is the, are these our days? Yeah. Are our days appointed? Are we living in a season determined, predetermined by God? Yes. And if it's predetermined, should we fear them? As many do, no. If he is in charge, you are courageous. There's a time, by the way, for Antichrist to appear. He will be revealed in his time, says Paul. He has his time, but don't worry about that. It's only for 42 months. Well, how it's interpreted, we'll see. But it's just limited. It's necessary. It's pre-planned and set, appointed by God. Don't be afraid of that. And there's a time for God to judge the earth. Revelation 11 says the nations rage. The kingdoms, uh, the kingdoms, uh, the nations raged, but thy wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, for rewarding thy servants, the prophets and saints, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. There are a lot of people destroying the earth today. There's a set, appointed time for their judgment, says the Lord, and that day is fixed. It's appointed. It's not known to you. It's not known to the angels, but it is coming, and it is clear. 
it is already written, so let it be written, so let it be done. And there's a time then also for you to receive the kingdom. For Daniel prophesied that Antichrist will make war with the saints with us and prevail over us for a time. Not spiritually, but our influence in the world. We may be seeing that now. But until, say the word until. <laughs> until the Ancient of Days came and then this judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints received the kingdom. It's appointed for you at the appropriate time to receive the kingdom delivered at the day and the return of Christ. Do you take courage from this today? Do you take a calmness and a confidence when even a lot of Christians are pulling their hair out at what's happening in our country and the world? Or is God driving history? Is he driving our country? Is he driving your life? Are you afraid of death? Is there an appointed time set by his grace for you to depart this world and go to the Father in peace? It's a far better way to look at it, and it is the scripture. The point is that the world and your life, watch this, is not out of control. It's in perfect control. It's under his command. If you want to look at it this way, God is the great air traffic controller in disguise. You know, all of history, you got nations, countries, individuals, all of you, you're pilots, you're flying your own planes. But he is so great on his high tower where he sits, watching on his radar every plane. He notes your altitude, your speed, what weather you're going through, whether it be peaceful or a storm. He knows how far you are from the airport, he knows how far you are from other airplanes. He knows that some are landing, some are taking off, some are being born, some are departing. Some are in the air, some are on the tarmac, some are in the hangar. And he is orchestrating, commanding, appointing, driving, giving courses for each, driving them all while you make your decisions and doing your best towards his accomplishing of his purposes for you in Jesus Christ and his purposes indeed are good and sure. And have confidence and certainty in that. Your life is timed. Is your birth timed? Yes. Mm -hmm. God says in Psalm 139, I put you together fearfully and wonderfully in your mother's womb. Oh, you women out there, how biblical you are. How many weeks did your mother or do you bear your children in your womb? 40 weeks, which is 40 what? Sevens. My goodness, I'm looking at a bunch of Bibles walking around in front of you. Do you know how biblical you are? You are an appointed clock. How marvelous is this? God saw your frame when you were made in your mother's womb and your children made in your womb. His eyes saw you there and he knows the events of your days. He says in the same psalm, I know when you sit down. I know when you rise up. I discern your thoughts from afar. I search out your path. You're lying down, and I'm acquainted with all of your ways. I'm the air traffic controller. I see your speed, your altitude, your distance, everything about you, your weather. I know what's going on, and I'm monitoring. I'm watching over you, and I'm driving you with your choices all the way to my purposes for you in Christ, which are good. I have also charged the time of your death. For in thy book were written every one of them, says David, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. Like the great comedian Stephen Wright said, I'm not afraid of death. I know when I'm going to die. My birth certificate has an expiration date. True. You know there is a set time and there is a destiny for the Christian. He destined us in love to be his son through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Watching over, monitoring you, guarding you, encouraging you, guiding you, leading you, directing your steps, all the way on your final approach, your departure from this world, now we're leaving on runway L11, such and such, saint departing earth, and your arrival time is on time when it gets to heaven 
Now coming in on final approach, so-and-so soul to make a safe landing in his kingdom. His, your times are in his hand. And so, does that mean you don't make any choices? No, you're making choices. You're a pilot. You're an airplane. You choose and chart your course, but you're choosing it according to the air traffic controller's commands. If people don't obey his commands, and he marks that their bearing is off, and he warns them, and they still go off course, they will go to their doom. People are having consequences for sin and rejection of him. But when you hear the tower, and he gives you the course command, well, if you acknowledge him in all your ways, he will make straight your paths. He will make them so, driving your life to the history that, and the pointed thing that he has for you. You are not out of control. You're under his marvelous control. And God is big enough with your weaknesses, all of your mistakes, all of your faults, with your triumphs, with your failures, with all the crazy events of your life, to still be there to see you, to monitor you, to guide you, to lead you, to make those paths straight and to bring you to your and his desired haven. As David says, Psalm 31, My times are in thy hand, O Lord. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies and persecutors. Let thy face shine on thy servant. Save me in thy steadfast love. And he will save you. He is saving you, and he already has saved you by driving and leading you to Jesus Christ. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our Savior, who has given you salvation through his cross and your faith in him. And God says, I make you my, my aircraft to ride and fly upon the heights of the earth. Uh, Isaiah 58 says, and I will bring you to my desired haven, that is, heaven, and to a safe landing in my kingdom to come. So in conclusion today, about time, fear not, says the Lord, be not dismayed or discouraged. For our God is a God, and there is, is God, and there is no other. And he says, I am God, there's no one like me. I declare from the beginning what shall happen at the end. And from ancient times I declare things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. So calm, courage, and confidence, for he will bring you to a safe landing in Jesus Christ, in the world to come, at the proper time. Conclude with Daniel chapter 7 then. The time will come for the saints of the Most High to receive the kingdom and to possess the kingdom forever, forever and forever in the land even beyond time. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.